so happy to see all of you. Look around the room. I mean, this is really, this is a, this is a historic day for the city of New Orleans. I mean, you, you are on ground zero of something that the city of New Orleans has never done. And I am, I'm just thrilled to be with all of you. When we started turning the city around together, I mean, really struggling from where we came from, which was a long way back, and trying to get our feet underneath us and stop the city from heading down in the wrong direction and turning it around and actually creating new opportunities. We were, all of us, thankful that we were able to wake up this morning, able to get our houses back where they needed to be, able to get our lives back where they needed to be, and then have found the strength, spiritually and physically, to fight back from Katrina, Rita, Ike, Gustav, the National Recession, the BP oil spill, the federal shutdown, I mean, whatever. The people in New Orleans said, whatever you throw my way, I'm getting back up. I'm going to stand back up. I'm going to get up off my knee. I'm going to take one step at a time, become hella high water, and with that boat, we're going to get on the business of creating a city that we all love. Now, everybody in this room knows how hard that is because all of you have been through it. And all of you know, because you've watched in the past three and a half years, all of us come together not to ignore our differences, but to really focus on making things right. And I don't need to go through the whole list of great successes that we have had together. But, like everything in our lives, on a day-to-day -day basis, there are lots of things that are great, and it's a business that we have not taken care of. And one of the things that jumps out to us in this city is the high level of violence that we have. Specifically, the high level of murders that occurs on the streets of the city and why that happens. And so it needs to be our mission as a people to make this not a city of death or darkness, but a city of light and life. That is what we are about. And murder is in and of itself a very bad thing, but it's also a symptom of something much, much deeper. And when you get into the issue, it takes you a lot of places that's uncomfortable to go. So we have developed something called Nova for Life, which is a comprehensive plan to make this a city of safety and a city of peace because you cannot be free. This is about freedom. You cannot be free if you do not feel safe. And that's true about all of us. And of course, we can't feel safe if we have institutions that are not doing the right thing, if we have individuals that are not doing the right thing, if we can't all come together and say, look, there's a lot of hard stuff to do, but at least everybody's got to be free to kind of have the things that America promises to each and every one of their cities, citizens, which is, you know, a life of happiness, the pursuit of happiness and opportunity and justice for all. That is what we are doing in the city of New Orleans, and so we have developed an over for life. And it is designed to move the city into a wonderful place so that all of us have opportunities. And of course, there are five pillars to that. And a lot of it is kind of common sense. If you want to stop the murders, you've got to stop the shooting. Right? Now, the what is always easy, it's the how that's hard. And so the first thing we need to do as a community is say, listen, whatever everybody has going on, Bad job situation, bad family, not as good education, whatever all of that is, the first thing we need to do is to stop the shooting. Because if we don't do that, we don't have time to focus on that other stuff. And in order to stop the shooting, we have to recognize that folks out there that are doing the wrong thing. So we got to figure out how to convince them to stop doing that. And a lot of that has to do with law enforcement, which is why we're working hard with getting the police department right, getting it focused, making sure it comes to compliance with the consent decree, making sure that they understand what community policing is about, trying to create a new covenant between the police department and citizens so that we are one family. And that's about law enforcement. It's why we're working with the U.S. Attorney's Office on the multi-agency gang unit. And why we're going out to the neighborhood and say, look, I don't know what ever happened, but you can't keep shooting each other and you can't keep putting us in harm's way. And we're not having any more killers like Brianna Allen, right? We're not doing that anymore. So that's really important. But everybody knows that you just can't get on the back end of this thing, right? You got to start early. And then you got to get everywhere in between. And so Noble for Life is about stopping the shooting. It is about investigating prevention. 
It's about promoting jobs and opportunity. I want you to remember I told you that because that's what today is about. It's about getting involved day to day, right in your neighborhood, on your street, doing the right things, simple things. Making sure your grass is cut, making sure the garbage is picked up, making sure if your neighbor needs help, you help them out. Making sure that the church that you belong to opens up their doors, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. So I just talked about personal responsibility, neighborhoods, churches, everybody's got to be in this game, right? And then finally, the fifth pillar is to improve NOPD, which is a whole subject matter that we're working on right now that we'll talk about. But no for life is the mission of everybody in the city. So all the stuff that you hear us talk about, building a new airport, recharging the river, right? Fixing the centers downtown, bringing in major companies like GE. All of that stuff is important and part of what we're doing, but part of that and the state is making the city safer. Now, everybody knows that the city will be safer if people have change in their pocket. And the way you can change in your pocket and the way you have something else to do is to have a job. That is really important. So one of the things that has been missing in this city, and by the way, it's missing in every city in America, right, is connecting the people who have needs, the people who have talent, with the opportunity to do the thing that not only helps them, but helps the community as well. So you've heard me many times say, listen, we need as much help as we can get from Washington. We need as much help as we can get from somebody else, but at the end of the day, we're the ones who will be responsible for helping ourselves. Now, economic growth, economic development, they're not the same thing. Economic development is me, the governor, the business community, the leaders here, going out to encourage Bill Gates, Jeff Emble from GE, whoever is doing anything to bring their jobs here. And that is a competition that goes on between city and states all the time that we're going to work on. We keep doing with that great success rate. 4,500 new jobs in the city. General Electric, the biggest company, right, in the world, put 100 high-paying, six-figure jobs down the street, and they're going to bring 200 more. And we have a lot of other examples about that. And that is important. We're going to keep doing that. But that is economic development. I want to talk to you about economic growth. Now that's different. What economic growth means is that every one of you in this room is going to reach down deep and figure out where your natural talent is, where your intellectual talent is, where your capacity is, and you are going to create something, not out of nothing, but something out of what you already have. Let me give you an example of what that is. When Marcellus, who is from New Orleans, who is from the street, has a natural talent that he developed into a marketable product, right? Greatest lawn player in the world, maybe the greatest musician in our lifetime by the time he's finished what he was doing. He took that natural talent and he added value to it. And he didn't just learn how to play the horn, he learned the business of music. And he had to go to New York and he created something called Jazz at Lincoln Center. Now around that raw talent that he added value to, he parlayed that into a $750 million infrastructure bank that built three auditoriums. And in those auditoriums, there are thousands of seats. And every night, somebody pays somewhere between $75 and $125 to sit in those seats and to watch the business that's going on up there. Construction jobs, day-to-day -day jobs for people that work in Jesse Lincoln Center, right? And then money for musicians, and all of a sudden, that is a business. Thousands of jobs created out of that cultural entity. Let me give you another example. Young kid comes out of the street, he goes to Xavier, he becomes a doctor because Xavier produces more African-American doctors than anybody in the nation. And they decide to get into research, and they do research, and they find the cure to an illness, a certain kind of cancer, something that's wrong with your brain, something that deals with your genetics. And you know what? They start to think about what they're going to do with that raw intellectual capital, where they bring in grants from the rest of the country, and all of a sudden those grants are paying people to come in and do research, high paying jobs. But then they figure out that they can actually make a medicine out of the brain power, the raw talent, they added value to it, and they're manufacturing the products here 
in the city of New Orleans, which is going to take place at the University Medical Center. Down the street, 12,000 jobs are going to be there. They're going to need med techs. They're going to need phlebotomists. Everybody knows what a phlebotomist is, even though that's a hard word to say. That's the people that take your blood, where you pray that they're really sweet. <laughs> are we on the same page? Yeah. That nice person that you look at and say, when you stick me, is it going to hurt? That's a phlebotomist. Right? Or a med tech. Are they going to need managers? Are they going to need pharmacists? Are they going to need nurses? Are they going to need doctors? Are they going to need people that run the institution? Are they going to need people that actually manufacture the products? That is what I'm talking about when we say we're going to add value to the raw material that we have. So I told you about creative talent. I told you about intellectual talent. Now let me talk to you about raw material. Raw material is the stuff that God gave us that happens to be in the ground in the place where we live. Right? Now, not every city in America has raw material. You have cities that have grown up and done great stuff without any raw material. Nashville, which has become the center of the music industry, did not naturally have that there. They thought about the business of it. Phoenix, which was a city built on dirt, got no oil and gas, but found out a way to get because they got into the notion of job and economic growth, which is people who are from there, using their talents, adding to their value, and creating jobs that exist. So that's why you saw us put together the Goldman Sachs 10,000 small business piece, where Goldman Sachs, the big money people, came in and said, look, the people in New Orleans said they needed to learn more about how to run businesses. So we picked 100 folks. We put them over at Delgado, who's here today. We trained them, right? And then we gave them access to capital. Each one of those businesses who were from New Orleans added two, three, four, five jobs. So GE came in and they brought 100, and over the next four years, they're gonna give us 300. But guess what happened in a year and a half in this city with people just like you in this room? At the Goldman Sachs day, we had 100 people. They went through the whole program. They added three, four, five. They created, out of economic growth, 500 jobs here in this very city. That is what economic growth is, and that is why we're here today, because the next piece, and the next piece is in this room, is taking the jobs that are going to be at the airport, the jobs that are going to be at the Surgeon Water Board, the jobs that are going to be at the University Medical Center, and correcting and connecting them directly to you, the citizens of New Orleans, who will do this. It will be the citizens of New Orleans that rebuild New Orleans. And today is the day that is taken two and a half years by our top level team, my Deputy Mayor Chief of Staff Judy Reese Morris, Barnisha, Michael, Brooke, and all the other folks that are here, the Dia Murray, the Dia and Amy Quirk, and I told them, let me tell you what y'all are gonna do. You are going to go find a way to create a pathway to prosperity. Now, that's a fancy word, but let me just tell you what it really means. I want y'all to think about Miss May. Now, everybody knows Miss May. Miss May sits on the porch, watches her neighborhood, right? May have gone to high school, probably graduated, but now she's sitting on the porch of the new housing redevelopments that we have, and she's about six blocks away from the medical center. Are you Miss May's son? Are you Miss May's brother? Everybody knows what I'm talking about, a composite of what we in New Orleans look like. But you sit in the thing, and you see the construction going on, and what I told them I wanted was not what, because everybody knows what, I need a job, but the how to get everybody in the city of New Orleans walking down a specific pathway to a specific thing that's related to your natural talent and the natural ability. It's about connectivity. So everybody hears this. Oh, Mr. Mann's great. You're talking all that trash about all the great stuff coming in. But everybody out of state's getting that work. Where are the people in New Orleans and how are we going to connect them to it? Well, the question just to be everybody, where am I supposed to go? What pathway do I walk down to get to the phlebotomist job, the med tech job? What pathway do I walk to if I want to work in the oil and gas industry? What pathway do I work to if I want to do really come out of science and attachment to whatever? And I told them, your job, and don't come back to me. Don't come see me until 
until you finish, I want a map. And I want doorways people can walk through. And I want you to get employers. And then I want to ask everybody for the city to come. So after two and a half years of work, we have now convened here this day to begin this process. It's the first day. And we have with us, how many employers? 30? We have 30 businesses in this room. All of you that represent those businesses, would you please stand up so people can see you? They're all here. All these companies that are with us today. Right? Give them a big round of applause. 34 of them. They have 350 jobs that are available right now. Right? We also have a group of individuals that I have asked to work with me that have said they wanted to commit that personal time to work with young men and folks from the city. These are the mentors. And we have 52 mentors in the room. Will all the mentors stand up so everybody can see you? And this building has in it different stations that our team's going to tell you to go to. But we're going to try to link you and your raw talent, your raw material, your intellectual capital with the jobs that are available. And today is just the first day. So like you hear me say all the time, there's a lot of talk that goes on in government. I have a lot of people that want to get in my ear about, man, this is what you need to do. But there was this priest in my life. His name was Father Harry Thompson who passed away some years ago, who was one of the brainchilds for Captain Reconcile. And every time you went and saw Father Thompson, and you said to him, man, you know, Father, this church could use a whatever. The next thing he would say to you is, well, I hope by tomorrow you bring me a plan about how you are going to make that happen. So when everybody gets in my ear about what, what I tell everybody, my staff knows this, he says, look, he already knows about the what. Right? Everybody's got an opinion about the what, right? But not so much about the how, the who, the when, and what it's going to look like when you finish. And so today is our answer to not just the what, but the how. And actually the connection, and then the rest of it is going to be on you to make things happen. And so I am just as excited as I possibly can be. Today is not just a one-off. Today is the beginning of a new way. Right? Not the what, but the way. And the way is about connectivity. It's about working together. It's about people reaching out. It's about taking that divide that used to exist because we didn't know each other and putting it together and then putting it on you. But let me just say this to everybody in this room. The city of New Orleans can build a new playground. The city of New Orleans can help build a new university medical center. The city of New Orleans can build a new police department. The city of New Orleans can do a whole bunch of stuff, but at the end of the day, when we finish doing that, somebody's got to use it right. Right? So somebody, my grandma told me once, if someone knocks you off the chair, that's on them. But if I come back next week and you're still on the ground, that's on you. And so this requires a partnership, and the partnership is about everybody doing what they need to do and not waiting. So we here to do our part. But we're only a small part of this thing. And when I say small, I mean small means we can set the table, but we're not here to eat the food. Right? We, we kind of want to help steer the boat, but we don't want to row the boat. Only you can row the boat. And all of you who are here today, when you get through all of this thing, are going to have ideas too. So why are you thinking about, can I go get a job at a certain place, and do I fit with Mr. Blackfield on the need for me, I also want you to think about being an entrepreneur and thinking about what business can I start on my own because I want to be my own boss and I'm willing to take the risk and I'm willing to do things that are necessary so that I then can create jobs for somebody else. So I don't just want you to be a job getter, which is great, but that's what you want to do. I want you to be a job maker too. And I want to set up the environment in the city where we can all do this. Now, I want you to think about this. If we can make this happen, Right? And the young men in the city that are having choices that they make, right? Or making bad choices. What do they say to you all the time? I don't really have another good choice. Right? So I'm a daddy. I got five kids. If you ask my kids, well, my daddy, where's the other one? Okay? This is what they will say besides you need to get up on time and hurry up. Or when mom 
was happy, I'm happy. Got all that. I say to them, good decisions equal good consequences. Bad decisions equal bad consequences. Right? And that is universally true. And so everybody says that to me. I said, okay, great. Well, I'm going to create an environment where people have a choice and can make good decisions. But you got to make a good decision. And let me just say this. Nothing about this is easy because going to work generally is not fun. Right? It takes a lot of discipline. It takes a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of preparation to the young man in this room. What I'm saying to you again is good decisions equal good consequences. Bad decisions equal bad consequences, and that is universally true to every human being that is on this planet. Black, white, blue, green, man, woman, you live in Canada, you live in France, you live in New Orleans, you live wherever you live. That is essentially the truth of how life is. And so what we are doing today is showing up, saying to you that we need to do our part. And what we want you to do, what we're begging you to do, is take this baton that we are trying to hand you and make sure that you pass it on and pay it forward and bring the people of the city together. And if we are able to accomplish this, I want you to think about how incredible your city can be if this is a city of safety and if it is a city of peace. If it's a city of safety and it's a city of peace, you will find that glorious thing called freedom that will not only make your soul soar, it will make this city be, of course, the greatest place we know we can be. But it's all on you. So God bless you all.